Ah, oh, so this. No, but this. Oh, yeah. Ah, oh, this is the other one. Yeah, there's the next one. one. So the ah, okay. Can I? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. So we're good. All right. Um, Marek comes to us from uh, ISA, and um, after his presentation, we'll take a break if everybody's okay with that. All right. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Marek Prochaska. I come from the European Space Agency and uh, I'm glad to be here. And um, some. It's not moving? No, it's just that there was some. Yeah. Showing some weird text there, but that's okay. Um, yeah, and uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some challenges of using multi-core processors uh, on board spacecraft and in particular uh, to things to do with timing analysis and the scheduling analysis uh, of flight software on multi-cores. So uh, I have heard few people uh, on, on Monday discussing multi-cores like the future thing uh, to look into so if we want to use multi-cores on board spacecraft, what do we actually need? So here is a list. Uh, first of all, of course, we need a space qualified multi-core to start with. Um, we also need uh, perhaps some case studies which show uh, the, how to use multi-cores, uh, whether we need them actually. We need a bunch of tools starting with an operating system and compiler, perhaps some sort of emulator if you want to do some all software uh, simulations. Uh, then we need some other tools, maybe to parallelize some existing algorithms which we have in our flight software. We need testing and debugging tools. Uh, we need to be able to use that capability to execute several things at the same time, executing on different cores. So we need to schedule these things and we need to be able to analyze if actually what we want to execute on multi-core uh, can meet our timing requirements so we need to have some timing analysis um, perhaps we need some benchmarks uh, some technology demonstrators and then after having all that we can actually consider flying multi-cores so this list is kind of an outline of my talk and I will briefly um, talk about uh, multiple activities which we have been running uh, at the European Space Agency in order to be able to fly multi-cores. And uh, I will f start with some uh, uh, sort of uh, use cases or case studies which we have done to show that we are, or which show that we actually do need to have multi cores, or multi cores can help us with certain issues. <coughs> I've seen a nice presentation uh, at Flight Software Workshop two years ago. It was a joint effort between NASA and uh, the Air Force uh, Research Lab, where I think that there was a study to find the next platform for, for next missions for future missions and the conclusion was yes multi cores that's the answer for that kind of environment and uh, we have done a couple of studies i will very briefly go through some of them uh, for instance this one is a euclid mission uh, to be launched in 2020 to uh, measure using uh, infrared detectors acceleration of universe to look into dark matter and dark energy so it's something what Herschel and Planck missions started before. And basically the conclusion was that there is so much data processing on board needed that uh, it would help greatly if we fly multi-cores on board that spacecraft. Um, another little bit different effort was to look at an existing, existing mission called Gaia, which was launched two years ago which is about uh, creating uh, a billion star um, 3D map of our galaxy. And, uh, and there is a video processing unit in there, 
which we ported on uh, multi-core, on Leon 3 and Leon 4, I will talk about them later. And for that we had to also port Artem's SMP, which uh, OAR are working on, uh, on Leon 3 and Leon 4. And we just wanted to see the difference between running that code on single core and multi-core. And we saw on quad-core processor speed up of 2.6. So reasonable speed up to achieve better performance. I've seen another study uh, to do with GNC, which was about uh, grabbing space debris using telescopic arm with camera at the end of the arm, where the camera was part of the closed loop to do the job. So again, that needed a lot of uh, CPU power to do, to do this kind of job. So, uh, so basically that's to justify why we really do think that we can and would like to use multi-cores in the future because as you know, in all gadgets which you have here in, in this room, uh, you have already multi-cores on your phones and uh, on your computers. So, so it's a technology which uh, is being used more and more. So um, uh, there is an existing uh, Leon 3 processor uh, which is branded by Geisler, by Cobham Geisler as GR712RC, which is dual core processor, uh, which is a usual Spark V8 type of processor. And uh, together with uh, Cobham Geisler, ESA is developing quad-core processor, which is called Leon 4, and we call it NGMP, which stands for uh, Next Generation Multi-Purpose Processor. And Cobham recently branded it as GR740. So there are, quad uh, there are four cores in there, um, frequency 400 megahertz. It's not completely... Uh, clear this number, but that's uh, more, most likely to happen. And there are two uh, double precision FPU units shared between the pairs of uh, cores. Uh, there is L1 cache per core, L2 cache shared between cores. Uh, you can download the whole data sheet. It's available on, on internet. And by the way, also uh, Geisler, uh, they presented uh, this processor three years ago at flight workshop in San Antonio, uh, including some benchmarks. So that's the processor we sort of uh, look at as, uh, as the future, or let's say reasonably near future. It should be out possibly next year. <coughs> and uh, in order to better understand uh, how we can use that capability, we have run several activities starting with this one, which was to analyze uh, system level impact of using multi-cores and looking at, in particular, that quad-core processor, uh, what we can do with it. And uh, we looked and identified some techniques, which uh, we, software techniques, in order to use uh, uh, multi-cores. So that research was more about execution models, task distribution, synchronization, also looking at software tools to, to do uh, uh, parallelization of existing algorithms and things like that. Also looking at uh, time and space partitioning on multi-cores and some optimizations for onboard data processing. What we found was a uh, couple of things. Uh, well. One of them is that uh, a lot of software which we fly is inherently sequential. So it's actually not that easy to use that <coughs> capability for certain things, for some uh, uh, high performance computing and things like that. Then the other thing is that uh, the fact that there are suddenly several things executing at the same time adds extra complexity to your software and it's not trivial to handle that complexity, especially if you consider that you have tasks with different criticality and you don't want those tasks with uh, lower criticality to threaten the ones with higher criticality. And m most importantly, uh, 
the way the multipores are designed uh, causes task interference because there are some low-level hardware resources which are shared between the cores. So if you look at uh, timing correctness on multi-cores, it's not uh, as easy, kind of easy, as on single cores where you typically what you do is you establish worst case execution time of a task, you do it for all tasks, and then you somehow put it together, perform timing analysis if that, can, if that thing is schedulable. Uh, but uh, uh, you start with uh, establishing worst case execution time, which is kind of constant for each task. Uh, in fact, that is not possible uh, on multi-cores because uh, due to the shared resources between cores, the worst case execution time of a task running on certain core depends on the workload on the other cores. So uh, that thing is not so easy and scheduling tasks on multiple cores is actually a quite complex thing. So uh, related to that is a notion of time composability. So you want your worst case execution time to be time composable, which means that uh, if you run task in isolation, uh, it's a worst case execution time is not affected by the rest of the system. So that's kind of a goal, perhaps not achievable goal. And uh, now I have a few slides just uh, briefly showing some types of scheduling. So I will show that very quickly. Basically in academia, you can find a couple of ways how to schedule tasks on multi-cores. And uh, this one is typically called global scheduling, where you have one scheduler, one operating system, which schedules tasks on all the cores. And that provides relatively high utilization of the system because the scheduler is aware of all the resources here. But uh, it comes with some overheads, typically due to migration of tasks from one core to another. On the other hand, you can use partitioned scheduling where you have scheduler, one scheduler per, per core and you statically assign tasks to, to cores. And then uh, you, you perhaps don't use the system efficiently because maybe there are some cores which are not used so much, but, uh, but that typically gives better average response times. And then you can have something in between where you have uh, you, you assign scheduler to subset of course and and uh, and that scheduler then uh, schedules the tasks on, on those cores um, in order to better understand uh, how this works and to better understand the performances we ran another study which was uh, to design benchmarking suite and uh, to execute that suite on, on the Leon 3 dual core processor and Leon 4 uh, uh, quad core, uh, which back then was not available uh, as a piece of hardware, so it was just uh, programmed in FPGA. And uh, the, the goal was to understand the intertask uh, interferences due to the shared uh, resources. And uh, and also to understand how to mimic uh, the, the interference and how, how this, uh, if you look at typical applications which we run, how that is similar. And uh, so what we proposed was a set of micro benchmarks which we called resource stressing kernels. And these resource stressing kernels are meant as co-runners uh, which you run on different cores to your piece of software and they put high pressure on particular resource and by doing that it's possible to find out uh, how much slowdown it's possible to cause to, to a piece of software and uh, we made uh, some quick observations uh, one of them was that if that thing was executed on COTS multi-cores, we saw significant slowdown. And, uh, and, and that 
some, somehow uh, made us think that uh, we n perhaps need slightly special type of multi-cores which have a little bit different properties than the COTS ones which you have on your phones. And then uh, the other one which is perhaps trivial was that uh, if we compared the quad core with the dual core we saw uh, that uh, there was much more interference and much more slowdown on the quad core of course because there are four cores so there are more tasks ex executing at the same time and fighting for the same resources uh, but also another reason was that there is uh, L2 cache which is shared between uh, the cores on, on the quad core Leon 4 so we made some more observations uh, with respect to uh, looking at CPU intensive tasks where the slowdown caused by these uh, resource stressing kernels was not so significant as opposed to some memory intensive tasks where we uh, saw up to 4.3 times slowdown uh, for code which had not so much store instructions and up to 20 times slowdown uh, when we had uh, tasks with a lot of store instructions. So if you imagine that you measure something and you, you think it takes, I don't know, 10 milliseconds and under some other uh, circumstances, if something else is executing on the other course, you don't see 10 milliseconds but 20 times more. It's quite some difference. Um, so uh, based on that study, we saw that there are clearly some challenges uh, for software to cope with it, to propose some scheduling and analysis methods, uh, how to tackle this, and perhaps also on hardware level to, uh, to propose some, let's say, improvements at, at, uh, on the board or on the, on the Leon 4 processor. Um, so um, uh, when it comes to software, we also looked at the option to to use um, time and space partitioning to perhaps tackle uh, that problem. So if you look at, uh, at standard uh, symmetric multiprocessing and you have, well, in this case it's RTEMS, but it's a single scheduler which is, uh, which is uh, scheduling tasks or applications on all these cores and then you have asymmetric multiprocessing where you have more schedulers, more operating systems you can add a hypervisor to that picture and the hypervisor schedules partitions instead and inside of each partition you have a partition operating system and, uh, and then the hypervisor uses adding 653 to schedule this thing and, and the benefit of that is that one, you don't need to parallelize these applications because the partitions are scheduled in a fashion that you you don't need to do any parallelization inside, but also the operating system inside does not have to be aware that it's running on multiple cores because that's the hypervisor which is handling this thing. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, found out that this, uh, what is called distributed IMA, works well on general multiprocessors, but not so well on multi-cores as they are designed today. And again, the problem is the interference and the fact that the hypervisor cannot quite cope with this. Um, so in the end, uh, at software level and at the level of analyzing our uh, system, we currently think, and that uh, research was done with uh, this Barcelona Supercomputing Center. I just realized that the Spanish uh, uh, colleagues here who were here, their building is just opposite to that uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which I did not know. Uh, so uh, what we currently think is that we sh should use for hard real-time systems, for more like platform software, we should use partition scheduling because recent studies kind of show that that might be better. And it, it has slightly lower utilization, as I said before, but, uh, but you avoid some, some complexity uh, by doing that. Then we propose to use the notion of partial time composability, which is if you have a task and if you want to establish its worst case execution time, 
if you do it, let's say, by measurement, because typically on multi-cores, if you use some tool to establish the worst case execution time, you might achieve a number which is the worst case execution time, but it's very unlikely that it would be so bad. So basically the number you get is too pessimistic. So you cannot really use it. So what do you typically do instead, even today, is that you measure how bad your, uh, your task uh, can execute and what's really the worst case execution time. And if you see that that number seems to be kind of independent on what is running on the other cores, then fine, use it, because it seems like your software is you know, not using some of the shared resources in the way that it matters too much what is running on the other cores. On the other hand, if you are not so lucky, then we propose that you seek to find partially time composable, com composable worst case execution time by looking into all possible workloads on the other cores and minimizing uh, the worst case execution time by optimizing task allocation per core. And then, of course, this approach is feasible only for a relatively small number of cores and small number of tasks. So uh, when you look at, let's say, four cores, 25 tasks, then you are in the order of few thousand combinations and that's still feasible that you try all of these. Uh, if you want to use 16 cores, 32 cores, 100 tasks, then you are easily in the order of millions and then uh, you cannot do this. And in this case, we propose to use probabilistic methods, to use uh, probabilistic worst case execution time. And the guys from Barcelona Supercomputing Center wrote a couple of papers on that topic and published them at, at uh, good conferences. And, uh, and basically, it's about performing a number of measurements uh, with the help of those micro benchmarks, those resource stressing kernels, and, uh, and trying to estimate probability of overrun. So basically, what you, you have an algorithm, you feed it with likelihood that there would be an overrun which is kind of acceptable to you because that probability is perhaps near to probability of failure of your hardware or something like that. And then you let the algorithm generate worst case execution time, which somehow links to that probability of overrun. And then uh, having that, you can use scheduler per core uh, where there are no assumptions on what is uh, running on the other cores. Uh, in terms of hardware solutions, um, we wanted to do a couple of things, uh, either by, uh, we wanted to improve the situation either by removing some of the interactions and making the, the, the sharing of the uh, shared resources inside multi-cores slightly better to make it more analyzable, or do some upper bounding of the interaction between tasks. So on the Leon 4 processor, there are so-called performance monitoring counters, which are basically, uh, the, the processor provides some information linked to certain events, such as number of cache misses, number of instructions executed, etc., etc. And we proposed to add one more counter, which would count how many interferences occurred on bus or on uh, cache or something like that. And that is nice because uh, having that, you can, during testing, establish some sort of value which you expect to be there for your piece of code. And you can use it at runtime to monitor that value and see whether some application is mi misbehaving. And even you can use that uh, not only at runtime during testing, but during execution to feed your FDIR that you can monitor this and in case that some low criticality task is really interfering too much and it's not in line with your expectations, with your model, then you can perhaps kill that task or put it to lower priority or something like that. 
so there was one proposal. Another one is to do with uh, arbitration policies uh, on the on the buses. Uh, another one was uh, to have part partitioned L2 cache and things like that. Um, Finally, I just wanted to mention quickly some other tools we were working on. Uh, I mentioned porting uh, Artemis SMP on uh, Leon 4. Also, we worked on this uh, emulator called Quirks, which is based on Quimu. Uh, and uh, the idea there is uh, to translate blocks of instructions rather than per instruction, and therefore making it not so instruction precise in terms of uh, timing, but relatively fast. So the current version of dual core Leon 3 is up to eight times faster than the real time uh, execution. And, uh, and that uh, emulator is ready also for Le Leon 4. So the, the point here is that with faster and faster processors, the traditional emulation is basically not feasible if you seek to have execution which is faster than real time. And uh, with multi-cores, it's even more so. We are also thinking to have an emulator uh, which would emulate the interferences from other cores. We have been looking at some uh, compiler optimizations for multi-cores and things like that. So to conclude, I've presented to you some challenges which you may, might face soon uh, when you want to start using multi-cores. And I've shown you some activities we have been doing at the European Space Agency uh, with a sp uh, specific har hardware, which is the Leon 4 NGMP slash GR740 processor, quad-core processor. I have discussed some software tools, Artem's SMP, benchmarks, compilers, emulators, and uh, uh, scheduling approach and timing analysis approach. Here is... Uh, list of European, but not only European uh, industry. Also, there is Cobham OAR who participated in that effort. And uh, that's it. So thanks very much. And uh, if you have any questions. Other So uh, I understand that you did the probabilistic uh, scheduling. Did you try like uh, elevator versus uh, fair use schedulers, like the standard Unix schedulers? I don't understand it. Uh, it's like uh, different scheduler types, like elevator scheduler, you know, pressing an elevator when the elevator comes, and then fair use schedulers and stuff like that. Did you try any of those? No, not that I'm aware of. I was just going to say that it's a shame. The presentation I did last year would have done really well with this because it was on all of the SMP um, work that had been gone on. And there was um, the Gaia application he mentioned. There was a timeline from a, uh, that Cobham, the guys at Gessler Aerospace, had uh, Aeroflex had uh, put together for that Gaia application. There's a bunch of use cases on how to apply the partition scheduler to avoid research, resource contention because we focus a lot on the cache, but he brushed over there's one floating point unit for two cores. So yeah. technically even the floating point unit is a source of contention. And I think there's a list, we're up to six to eight things now that we know that if you've done them on a unit processor application are inherently broken for SMP. So you can, and I think that was the big lesson we learned doing the SMP work is that no matter how diligent you are, your unit processor code is not SMP safe and you just might as well assume that going in. But last year, my presentation last year on SMP dovetails really nicely in this. So. Yeah, but I think it's an interesting Thanks point. For supporting yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. But uh, I think it, it's an interesting point what you said because uh, some people, some presenters on Monday mentioned like, ah, now we are waiting for the industry to bring this multi-core thing and to make it available for us. But in fact, as you can see, there is a lot of work for us to get ready for the multi-cores. So I think we should better start. As I, as I walk the microphone to you, let me point out that Joel's presentation is on the web page from last year. And so related to the hardware support, um, I really like the performance counters approach that you mentioned um, because 
I, I feel like it, it might get buy-in from hardware industry. Um, do you have, so you kind of brushed past it. I, I've seen a lot of work done sort of in the European zone, as it were, in the um, time randomized approaches to the processor architecture. Yes. Do you have a feeling that there's any traction there or, or that the, the performance measurement counters might be a better sort of approach to look toward? Well, I saw that the guys proposed some software level randomization because otherwise uh, yeah, I don't think that they rely on randomized hardware architecture. So they focused on being able to add some randomization to the operating system. And that is how you can then rely or your model can rely on the randomized uh, execution. You mentioned that in some cases um, uh, you can get up to 20x of a performance hit from uh, from having different things scheduled at the same time. Do you have any in indication as to whether or not that's uh, some sort of a hardware issue that could be fixed at the hardware level? Because it seems like if you have four different things all trying to access the same resource, uh, they shouldn't get much more of a penalty than 4x. Yeah, but, uh, but you have to consider that there is a couple of things which, I mean, I if you want to access cash, then by definition you also share the, the bus which leads to the cache. So it depends on number of things. It's not so simple. You have some sort of TDMA uh, arbitration mechanism on, on the bus and then the moment you get your slot you, you are hit again by you know something not being ready at the level of the cache and things like that. So, so, so I think that the uh, I think on one of my slides I did not emphasize uh, enough that there was number of proposals about bits and pieces which should be improved and have been already improved by Cobham Geisler on this quad-core processor. And these uh, performance count, well, there are existing performance counters, but those uh, to do with the interference, I think that, that will not make it next year for the release of the processor, but are so somehow on the list maybe for future versions. But there was a number of small improvements, so you are right, basically. Okay, other questions? No? Oh, putting microphones in the ceiling would be just the best, I'm just saying. So the, the problem with the interference has to do with uh, cache coherency largely and because and, and if they're accessing different parts of the memory and they don't have to, and, and they don't actually interfere with each other and you don't. Also because uh, to, to access the memory they need to go on Amba bus. And right. FPU, so as, as Joel mentioned, FPU is another one. But you could also look at supercomputer-like architectures where instead of sharing the memory, you shared the network and you could end up... So what about that alternative? Well, I, I, in fact, I'm not a hardware guy, but I know that there are such things. But basically, this architecture mimics the sort of standalone current multi-core architecture. It, it Absolutely every way. Because <laughs> these problems exist on these platforms too. Yeah. I, I want to comment on what you said. Yeah. One of the things... Here, wait, sorry. Did it again. <coughs> Going back to my present the presentation last year, one thing, the Leon 3 and 4 are very simple, even, I mean, relatively speaking. And from a block diagram picture, they're fairly simple and about as easy to analyze as any SMP architecture you're going to look at. When you move over, I've got pictures of the AMD bulldozer and then the QRIQ, and they get worse and harder and harder to analyze to the point where I've talked to the BSD kernel developers, and they have special code not to move you from one instance of a four core module to another because there's like three levels of cache. So they actually, in the BSD kernel, try not to move a process across that silicon module boundary. This problem is really hard, and if you start taking advantage of too many fancy tricks that are really good on desktops and in the supercomputer, we end up breaking any hope of really analyzing this mm. or you being able to figure out how to deploy to get anything that's vaguely predictable. And that's one of the things I, I came out of this learning is we probably can slowly tune the hardware and the software to give you a good base to work on, but every application <coughs> that goes SMP is gonna have to go through a lot of these issues on their own. 
So it's it's you have to have something that's predictable and analyzable, and that's the core tenet of doing this type of real time embedded work. Very good. Okay. Any other questions? Very good. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are, are incredibly patient. I, I would recommend we take a 10-minute break. Can we do that? 10 minutes? Okay. Let's come back at 3 o'clock.